everyone, welcome back to Rolling Solo. My name is Adam Smith. Today we begin part number one for Bloodborne, the board game. The gameplay is the focus in this video. If you haven't checked out my unboxing video for the core experience of Bloodborne, the board game, as well as the setup video, I'll put a link to the whole showcase in the top right hand corner right now. You can go check those videos out first to get a better understanding of how everything here got to the table and what components you can find in that core box. So without further ado, with my single hunter, we're going to be going on a journey through Yarn as I try and survive the long hunt. Of the monsters created by the Beast Plague, the Scourge Beasts are the most reviled. Once human, these terrible monstrosities are fast, agile, and lethal. As of late, more and more of these beasts have begun appearing in Central Yarmin, and thus we have been tasked with discovering the source of their increasing numbers, as well as eliminating as many as possible. With the introduction to the long hunt now read, we can take a look at chapter one's mission side of the card down here, and it states to start the hunt, reveal card number one. Again, there's always a brick of cards that associates itself with the campaign you're playing. We're going to that deck right now, and the top card is the one we're after. The card we've revealed is a hunt mission. It says, the source of the scourge, we must take to the streets of Central Yarnum. The number of scourge beasts grows, and we must leave no area unchecked and uncleansed. We we should also gather what information we can find from the surviving townsfolk. Perhaps they can grant us insight into the cause of this sudden infestation. It states here at the very bottom, end a move on the central lamp tile, which is the tile we're actually currently on, after you've collected at least two insight, and at that point reveal card two. Each chapter has one hunt mission, so you can see we found the beginning of the major hunt mission we need to focus on, and I need to complete this in order to win, and a number of insight missions will also be available and pop up as we explore throughout the tiles. Now it's worth mentioning these insight missions are essentially side missions that are going to reveal more of the events of the surrounding story of the campaign, and then once completed, insight missions are going to grant some awesome rewards and further aid me in trying trying to get through this scenario. In this case, right off the bat, this hunt mission wants me to go ahead and try and complete two insight missions to gain cards that will count towards the two we need in order to get back to this central lamp tile that we're currently on with that two insight and be able to then move to the next step in the hunt mission. Now in terms of winning and losing the hunt, when you win the hunt, it's pretty straightforward. If you complete the hunt mission, then the game immediately ends and you are victorious and win the chapter. Now it's worth mentioning just because there's one hunt mission in play right now, it doesn't mean that's the only one we're gonna have to succeed at in order to beat the chapter. There is likely going to be more. And we know this because the red text we just read states we'll be revealing card number two once we get two insights. So there are different stages to these hunt missions that you're gonna have to go through but don't worry the lingo on the card itself in terms of the text in that red area there will let you know that you're getting close to the end of the chapter so it will give you subtle hints in terms of how it's written. And it wouldn't be Bloodborne if there wasn't a way to lose the hunt. At the start of the round, if the hunt track, which is at the bottom here, has reached its final space, the players, or player in my case, will have one final round to win the game before Yarnum is lost. If they cannot, the hunters have failed in their task and the campaign ends right there. The players, or myself, would have to start again from the very beginning of the campaign and hopefully fare better the next time around. So, it is an unforgiving game. It's going to come at you with this time track so you're going to have to manage what you do and what you choose to do strategically very wisely. You'll notice right on the mission card for the chapter that you're currently in, there's typically some text here, and you'll want to read this so you have an understanding of what things you could go after in order to reveal more from the campaign deck. So we've already done the start of the hunt. We've revealed card number one. We know where that ends and what we now need to do based on the hunt mission. But below it, it states if we happen to end a move on the courtyard lamp or end a move on the occupied house or the ransacked house, we're going to be pulling cards for those as well. These will likely lead into insight missions. So now that we have a much better understanding of what the long hunt entails in terms of what it's asking us to do for the hunt mission and the backstory, we've also gone over the win and loss conditions. Let's now talk about the round. The very first round we'll be walking through. Now the first section of this player aid card you're seeing on screen, I'm going to skip past the actions as you're going to see that as we actually play through the game. Below that is the round summary where it states the start of the round, the hunters are going to refill their hands to three and advance the track by one space. So we'll go ahead and do 
do this very shortly. The next step after that is the Hunter turn, where we can actually go ahead and perform a number of actions as labeled above. And then lastly, end of the Hunter turn, enemies within one tile will activate. We will rinse and repeat this round over and over until we either meet our goal or fail at it. So right off the top, we'll begin our Hunter's turn by drawing three cards, which I have. I've got a basic card here, which can allow me to place an additional damage when using it in an attack. I have another basic card here that could potentially be used in order to dodge, or I could just discard the card as I could with any of these cards in my hand to perform any action I wish in terms of attacking, moving, interacting, transforming a weapon, or going to the Hunter's Dream. And then the last one there in blue is a basic and it's stat Again, dodge and stagger are really going to come in handy during combat, so I have to be wise as to when to use it to discard the entire card, not gaining the dodge or stagger ability, but just to initiate an action, or whether I should hold on to those cards for situations where I'm being attacked, or I want to attack, and I want to have a good condition or advantage in that fight. Next, we'll go ahead and move the hunt track up by one. It's worth noting there are red spaces along this hunt track, and if you're unfamiliar with what those are will be touch on them when I land on them but essentially they are reset points and yes they sound as bad as they are so going back to the player aid we saw earlier, you'll see the actions listed out. It says each uses one card, and that's what I was referring to just moments ago when you can discard a card in order to take an action. This is where the card-driven gameplay of Bloodborne really starts to shine, is you can use the cards in order to do an action, or you can actually use them for what's depicted on the card itself, especially during combat. And that's where things get really interesting. So we have actions like attack, we have move, we have interact, we have transforming the weapon, and we have going to the hunter's dream. Now you'll see all of these happen as we go through the playthrough, so I'll just let that happen automatically. Just before I go ahead with my first turn, I want to talk about three things on this central lamp tile. First off, you'll see white dividing lines. So this is divided up into three different areas where you can move across them. You're allowed to move across white lines, that's no issue. It's just dividing up the tile in terms of movement. In the very, very middle, you'll see a miniature of a lamp. That is a lamp you can return to when you come back from the Hunter's Dream. So how do you get to the Hunter's Dream? Well, as I talked about in the actions list, for one card, out of my hand, which I have three right now, I could discard a card to go to the Hunter's Dream. There are pros and cons to doing this. We'll talk more about it later when it makes sense to go there. But when we come back to the game board, because when you go to the Hunter's Dream, you literally leave the actual central Yarman and go to the Hunter's Dream. When you come back, you'll land in one of the lamp spaces that aren't broken. So as you progress throughout the game, more tiles will be revealed. You'll find more lamps. Sometimes they will be active and other times they'll be broken. You'll see how this works as we go. The third thing I want to mention is at times there will be an area of text on the tile which you should definitely read because it might give you an advantage or potentially a disadvantage in that particular location. So this one says interact on the central lamp space to teleport to any lamp space or inside any fog gate. So this could be really useful for getting around the game board by going to this central lamp. So looking at my hand of cards here, it can actually be quite tough sometimes to predict what's going to happen, but you have to think about not only offense but defense as well so I have a basic card there that can do additional damage that's certainly nice but I have cards that can actually be really helpful to dodge an enemy's attack or stagger them and we'll talk more about those effects I'll show you them on the player aid very very soon but for me right now what I'm going to do is I'm going to choose to actually use my stagger card and I'm not using it for its stagger ability I'm discarding it into my discard pile beside my hunter's deck in order to gain some movement points and I gain two movements. So I'm going to move myself one over to the right and we're going to go explore a new tile. Just like that, we've moved to a new tile, taking a tile off the top of the tile deck and placing it down as long as the exits connect, you're safe. So you do have a choice in terms of its orientation. With the occupied house, there's actually three exits off the tile, so I could have changed this orientation in any way I want, but for the sake of having things heading north versus south, I've set it up like this. 
Now, if you guys remember from the Chapter 1 Missions card, finding the occupied house was a good thing. This is going to help us reveal a card, but before we get ahead of ourselves, let's talk quickly about the movement between tiles here. So, basically, my Hunter, when I choose to go ahead into a new tile, I have to use one movement and move into that new tile. I cannot choose to reveal a tile and then go, oh, that looks really bad. I don't really want to go in there. Let's go the opposite direction with my movement. I still have to burn one movement in the new tile. Tile. And then from there, if I have any left over, which I do in this case, I have one extra after this, I can then choose to run away if I want. However, here's where things get quite interesting in Bloodborne. Now, when a monster spawns in a location, especially a brand new tile like this one, you'll see an icon there. That icon is going to be shown on the hunt board, and if you take a look at it, the Scourge Beast is right underneath of it, so we must spawn one. This makes the idea of running away a little bit tougher, especially with the Scourge Beast, because the Scourge Beast has a special ability that when it needs to pursue you, if you choose to run away, it's going to move up to two two spaces to get to you. So you're going to have a really hard time running away from this thing. Other enemies only pursue at movement of one, or maybe some special other enemies have different movement patterns. But that again plays into the strategy of whether you should run or fight. Now, as you all remember, at the very beginning, we talked about the mission card and the occupied house was one of the tiles we were looking for. So it states here, ending a move on the occupied house tile will reveal card eight. Well, we're not done with our movement just yet as we've only used one point of movement. I still could move one more if I wish. The last remaining movement point I'm going to use to go right to the occupied house and end my movement. But just before my movement ends, or right as my movement ends, this monster doesn't like the fact that I left its space. And it's not going to leave me alone. It's going to pursue me and join me. With my movement now complete, we can go ahead and reveal card 8. And then we can go back to resolving the rest of the hunter's turn. It appears we found an insight mission. It says, a safe haven. You knock on the door from inside, a frail and elderly voice addresses you. A hunter? About time you showed up. It ain't safe out here for an old woman. Reckon you can take me somewhere to wait out the night? Now at this point, we're going to place one survivor token on the occupied house space. Any hunter may pick up the token when they move out of the space. The token's returned to the occupied house if the hunter teleports or goes to the dream. End a move on the chapel tile with the token to reveal card 9. All right, at this point now we have a survivor and we'll actually be able to take this survivor with us the second we start moving away. But for now, let's go ahead and shift our focus to dealing with this scourge beast because we know that if we don't and the hunter's turn ends, well, enemies are going to activate and that's going to have some fun coming our way. So let's go ahead and go through the process of an attack. Now, combat in Bloodborne is where this game really shines. There's a lot of really cool mechanisms within the game, allowing you for different strategic options to go up against these enemies. Now, first off, it's better to understand your enemy and also understand your trick weapon that you currently have slotted in to make the most use of the cards that you have at your disposal. Now, looking at the hunt board, I highly recommend from the very beginning of play that you take a look at each of the enemies you're going up against to get an idea as to what kind of attacks they can generate when they're ready to activate because it's going to help you to strategize as to what you need to hold in your hand in order to go up against some of these monsters. Now, granted, sometimes when you enter a tile for the very first time, you're going to be surprised. I didn't expect to find a Scourge Beast right away, but I did, right? So in this case, we're going to the hunt board to learn a little bit more about what it can potentially do and how I can hopefully stop it from destroying me. So in the top right hand corner, we have a four that'll let you know how much damage you need to put on the Scourge Beast. Below that, it's broken into to three major sections with a little piece of information at the bottom we'll touch on in a second but we have basic special and ability so there is an enemy action deck that you saw during setup that enemy action deck is comprised of just six cards. There's three basic, two special, and one ability. This is going to give you an idea as to potentially what's coming down the line. Now, when we haven't drawn any enemy actions yet, we aren't going to know anything about what this thing could throw at us. So we're concerned about all three of these different areas of the card, whether it's basic, special, or ability, because all of them sound nasty. But once you start moving through that enemy action deck of six cards and a couple of them have come out, the odds of you knowing what is coming next start to increase, meaning you can start strategically planning to deal with some of the nastiness the AI is going to throw at you. This is where the strategy comes in, where you can start to learn your enemy, learn what it's going to do to you, and try to avoid it in order to take it out. 
So at a high level, let's talk about what we're seeing here. So basic right there has three arrows. It's called quick swipe. So basically those three arrows mean fast. There's fast, medium, and slow. Those are the different rates of speed that your attack is doing. So the Scourge Beat, when it does a basic attack, is doing a fast attack with two damage. If it's a special combo slash, it's doing a medium speed attack with two damage. But it also mentions down below that even if the attack is dodged or staggered, which is one of the possible conditions, conditions we can throw on the enemy, the hunter still must dodge at a speed of two or suffer two additional damage. Pretty nasty. So we need to make sure we have a dodge ready, which I actually do have. So that's another reason why having dodges is a very good thing to have. And then the ability on the bottom has Feral Rage. It says flip another enemy action and the Scourge Beast next attack gains plus one damage and stagger. So that one's nasty in that it's going to build up and throw even more at you. At the very bottom of the card, you're also going to notice it mentions Scourge Beast move 2 when activating or pursuing. You'll remember earlier on when I talked about the fact I could have run out of the particular space I was in with the Scourge Beast, and I said the Scourge Beast had an ability that allowed it to run after me or pursue me uh, for 2 movement. That's where this information comes from, which is one of the reasons why it's worth reading these cards, because there might be some kind of information on these cards that doesn't directly relate to an attack or combat combat, but is still worth knowing in terms of behavior. So now that you have a better understanding of what the enemy can do to us, let's talk about how we actually start an attack and what we have to do strategy-wise in order to set ourselves up for some success. So first off, taking a look at the Hunter dashboard here, we have a trick weapon on one side. This entire dashboard can be flipped to the opposite side. It can clear all the slots. That costs the discarding of one card to do so. At this point, we don't need to do it. We're moving right into attack. In order to initiate an attack, you need to take a card from your hand. I have two left. I have the basic dodge and the basic plus one damage. I'm going to take one of those cards and I'm slotting into one of the three slots on my trick weapon. And there's a actual strategy around which of these slots I place it into based on what I want for speed and what I want for damage. So taking a look at my Hunter dashboard right now, you'll also notice an ability just above the three areas of color there. It says on kill, draw one and heal one. So I have a really nice ability on this side of the trick weapon for the saw cleaver that once I kill this thing, I'll be able to heal one if I've taken any damage, but also draw a card back up, allowing me to extend my turn potentially, which is pretty cool. Now, using the two cards that I have in my hand, I have to place one in a slot to initiate the actual attack. And it is worth looking at the center of the card because that will have an impact on the attack in almost all cases. In this case, the middle of the card states that I'm gonna get a benefit of additional damage, meaning my total damage now on the attack is going to be four, which is perfect because that's exactly how much health this thing has. The only problem is in order to get this much damage, just like those familiar with the video game, know you're going to be throwing that damage at a slower pace so because of this the enemy might actually be quicker on its attack than you are hitting you first before you have a chance to wipe it out now this is just an example of another way I could do the exact same attack now the only difference here is I'm initiating an attack by using the dodge card the one thing to note is if you use a dodge card when you first select your stat card for the attack, you don't gain the benefit of the dodge keyword, which is pretty nasty because that is actually a really handy strategic thing to have in your back pocket. You want to keep these cards in hand for the next step after the enemy flips their enemy activation and you gain some knowledge on what it will do, then you can decide to go ahead and use your dodge to get past it, hopefully. So that's why I highly recommend when you're starting out, don't use dodge cards out of the gate to initiate attacks. That's going to put you in some pretty bad spots early on. So that's simply it. To initiate an attack, you drop a card in one of the slots. That's it. And now we move over to the enemy action deck. We flip a card to reveal what the enemy will be doing. The Scourge Beast is going to be using its special, which is a card coming right off the top of the enemy action deck. Now we know going forward, because remember, this enemy action deck is shared across all enemies, depending on whenever an enemy actually activates and needs a card flipped. We now know a special has been used. The deck has three basic, two special, and one ability, as I mentioned before. So now we know there's three basic, one special, and one ability in there. And as that begins to keep going, we will then have better knowledge as to what's coming down the pipes, and we can actually react to it based on her speed and damage and whether we want to try and dodge something or stagger it. These are the kind of things you want to keep in your back pocket strategy wise. 
Oh yes, this one is a nasty one. It's called the Combo Slash. It is at a two speed, it has two damage, and it states even if the attack, which is the attack above at two speed, two damage, is dodged or staggered, the hunter must dodge at two speed or suffer additional damage. All right, so at this point in the combat, as you can see, it moves really quickly with less explaining, but basically you pick a card, you put it in a slot, you then flip the enemy action card to determine what the enemy is gonna do, and the third step of resolving in combat is all around dodge. So at this point in time, if I wish to dodge this attack, I really want to ensure that I'm putting it in a slot that's at least medium or fast. And luckily my attack was actually in the slow area. So that's perfect because I can place a dodge card that I kept in either of these two locations. And being that the speed is at least medium or higher, I'll be able to dodge all the damage coming at me from that special. So in this case, I know that both of my slots will work in order to dodge this special. So it doesn't matter which one I place it in. Now there's other cards you may place in a slot that are going to sit there and they're not going to clear immediately. So for instance, when we actually went ahead and did an attack, we placed one over here and this card stays in that slot. Whereas the dodge when it's used, like I just used it, it states right there to clear the slot. So the second you place it to dodge the enemy, you then clear the slot by taking the card and putting it in your discard pile, leaving you room to still use that trick weapon in multiple ways later on. So I successfully dodged the attack. The card is now in the discard pile. My slots have opened up and we move to the final step of combat, which is resolving attacks. Resolving of attacks is very simplistic because at this point you know what the enemy's doing, you know what you're doing, and now you're just taking a look at the speed and comparing. So you're going to initiate things based on who's going the fastest. So in this case, I'm actually going slow. The enemy's going at a medium speed, but I dodged the enemy's attack. So nothing happens on the enemy side. It comes to me, my slow attack now comes through, and I carve this thing for four damage, which is enough to wipe it out. Killing one of the enemies inside of Bloodborne will drop a Blood Echo that you immediately get to collect and place on your Hunter dashboard. Just like that, I've placed the token in my Blood Echoes area. You'll see there's a max of three that you can have. And remember, these are really, really good to have when you go to the Hunter's Dream, is you can cash them in as a one-for-one one to get upgrade cards into your deck, which is pretty awesome. Now, there's a couple of the things in the dashboard here I just want to mention, because we're done our attack now. We've wiped out the Scourge Beast, and not every attack is going to work like this. You're not always going to be able to wipe an enemy out in a one-shot kill like I just did. The way the cards came out in my first set of hand worked out well for me this time, but in other situations it's going to go back and forth through a number of attacks to try to take it out. Um, the one thing I want to mention though is at the very bottom of your trick weapon you'll see an ability mentioned as well as the three different slots whether they're in terms of their speed and their damage on the opposite side of the trick weapon. So at any point in time you're looking at your current trick weapon that you have here which is the saw cleaver in my case I know I can only really see visually the major two that I have available, but I know that I can look at the bottom of this trick weapon to see what would happen if I happen to flip this card over by discarding a card, which is changing my trick weapon to something else that will allow for different types of attacks at different levels of speed and damage. Keeping an eye on that stuff as well as the ability will certainly help you strategy wise. The final thing to keep your eye on that's on your hunter dashboard is of course the pistol. It states right here, when an enemy makes a basic attack, automatically stagger that enemy. So when can you use this? Right in the middle of an attack. So remember the four different things that are happening during attack. First, you slot a card onto your trick weapon that initiates the attack. Then after that, you're gonna go ahead and draw an enemy action to determine what the enemy is doing. At that point, if it comes up basic and you don't like what basic is throwing at you, it's in that moment you can decide, rather than relying on the next step, which is dodge, you can go ahead and flip this hunter pistol over in order to stagger the enemy instead. So let's take a look at the player aid and find out what stagger does. Now you remember we just read off the hunter pistol. It says when an enemy makes a basic attack, automatically stagger that enemy. Think of that ability as almost a superseding type ability. It's so powerful that as long as the enemy pulls a basic attack, you can use your hunter pistol to stagger. So you'll also notice the definition states cancel an enemy attack with a slower speed. The slower speed doesn't apply when you're using your hunter pistol. You just need to get a basic attack from the enemy and you can stagger it. What that's referring to is if you choose to use a card in your slot on your trick weapon that has the keyword stagger, you need to ensure you're able to do it at a faster speed than the enemy's throwing at you.
So as an example, you guys remember earlier the special triggered, it was a two speed attack coming from the Scourge Beast. And let's say hypothetically, I started the attack, we know it's a special, and now it's on to me to choose to use my Hunter Pistol, which I can't use because it's not a basic attack, or I could dodge. Let's say I changed up what I did in terms of the cards I played, and I used the dodge to move earlier, and I kept the stagger. At this point in time, if I go ahead and place a stagger in this slot right here, nothing is gonna happen. I'm getting no benefit from that whatsoever because that is at the exact same speed. I need to be staggering at a faster speed than the enemy is throwing their attack. So this would need to be placed in this section right here, and then I'd be able to go ahead and cancel the enemy attack. So heading back to the player aid here, we'll take a look at dodge. You saw dodge in action, so I'm not gonna read this out because you literally saw me do it just moments ago to the Scourge Beast, but really the key point you you want to focus on inside of that area is that it has to be the same speed or faster on a dodge in order to not suffer damage and ignore the attack effects whereas with stagger if you're playing a stagger card you need to ensure you're doing it at a faster speed than the enemy's attack you can never do it at an equal speed and that's the difference between the two and this is again in both cases when you're playing a card onto your trick weapon if we're talking about getting a stagger from a weapon like the hunter's pistol you just saw that has its own rules and is based on whether I pull basic or not. So now with our first combat resolved, you understand the basics. And when we move through the next combat, I'll be moving at a much faster pace. You can see how this resolves so much more quickly when there's less explanation involved. Now, the other thing I want to mention is something on my player board that I certainly don't want to forget about is on kill, draw one and heal one. Well, I'm not healing anything because I'm still at a max six health. It didn't hit me at all, but I definitely will draw a card right now. I ended up drawing another dodge card, which is pretty awesome. I might want to keep this or I might want to use it. And this is again, part of your strategy. You are allowed to go ahead and choose to end your turn with cards in hand. That's a-okay. It's just when your turn comes back around again in the future, you'll only be drawing up to three. You'll never be able to keep cards for the sake of having more cards later on. But what you can do is use that draw keyword to bring cards into your hand during your hunter's turn to prolong how long and how much you can do and that's definitely another strategy you can employ when playing the game. Now here's another aspect of strategy you want to keep in mind, especially when you get a card like this at the very tail end of your turn. There's a couple things to think about. First off, you can go ahead if you want to and discard this card to move. I could choose to move out of the occupied house and when I do so I take the survivor token with me and we begin our journey trying to find the associated chapel in order to drop the survivor off in order to rescue them. So I could do this. Uh, the only downside is, just thinking about this logically, is I would get two movement. I can move north once and then move into a new tile but then I'm out of cards and I'm sitting potentially in front of who knows what so that doesn't sound like a real recipe for success probably moving into a tile with no cards in hand is not exactly the best option the other thing to think about is when it's not your turn if you do not have any cards in your hand and there's any enemies that are currently on the game board they are going to attack you and if you don't have cards to do things like dodge and avoid bad situations from coming your way well you're just not prepared so in this case because i drew a dodge card i'm going to actually stop i'm not going to use this for anything else i'm going to hold on to it because even though there's no enemies on the board currently and i have no fear of them showing up this time around i'd rather keep that dodge for whatever is probably coming around the corner when we reveal the next tile on my next turn so looking at the round summary here we've gone through the start of the round we've gone through a full hunter turn we now technically move into the end of the hunter turn which means the enemies within one tile would activate we don't currently have enemies anywhere on the game board at this point in time but it's worth mentioning something here when it says enemies within one tile, it literally means within a full tile away. So if there was an enemy all the way to the west on the central lamp tile, in that furthest space to the west, it could still activate and start moving towards me. We begin a new game round. There's two things to do here. First, we have to advance the hunt track by one. And second, we get to refresh our hands. So looking at my hand right now, I have one card in it. I can choose if I want at this point to discard it. And then I have to draw up to a total of three cards. If I choose I want to keep it, then I'm just drawing two. And because it's a dodge card and it sounds really useful, I'm going to hold on to it. We'll just draw two more. 
Not a bad pull. We got a card here that allows us to draw one. We also have another one of those plus one damage cards as well. We'll also go ahead and uptick the hunt track by one as it gets closer and closer to a reset point. One thing that I caught and actually knew this but forgot about it while explaining how dodge works and stagger works is the fact that this special combo slash that came from the Scourge Beast is extra nasty. It's called a combo slash for a reason, which means you're being hit twice essentially. So what it's saying there in the ability down below is even if the attack is dodged, which I did dodge the attack, the hunter must dodge again at a speed of two or suffer two additional additional damage. So I was not able to dodge twice inside of the same attack. If I had an additional dodge card in my hand and I could have slotted it in at the matching speed or better, then I would have been fine, but I didn't have it. So because of that, I do actually have to suffer two damage. Now the good news about this catch is that yes, I'm going to reduce my health from 6 down to 4, which isn't great, but remember when I talked about on kill, drawing one and healing one? Well, I would have actually had some damage at that point, so I should have actually healed back up, so I'd be at a total of 5. So all in all, getting hit from a pretty nasty special off that Scourge Beast and not being able to dodge it twice to avoid that nasty ability, coming out with only a slight scratch really wasn't that bad. Starting my hunter's turn from the occupied house, also taking the survivor token with me as I move out, I'm gonna be discarding this basic card here, and that's gonna enable me to move two spaces. I will move north one space, and then we'll head to the exit to the east. Gone ahead and revealed the next tile. It is an alleyway tile, which actually is not any of the tile names that I need in order to progress through the campaign deck. So this is a random tile that was added in. So this is going to present a couple different options for me. Now, first, I do need to still move into the tile I've revealed with my last movement. Now my options here are, I could try to go past the Huntsman's Minion and risk it pursuing me and trying to go out the exit even further east, but that's taking me further away from the central lamp tile that I'm trying to get back to when I've got my insight to actually try and progress the hunt mission. So let's not go too far away from the central lamp tile and instead, rather than trying to deal with this Huntsman's Minion with the fact I've only got two cards now and I might be in a sticky situation for damage, this thing has five health, I might want to try to turn tail and run. I'm going to choose to discard my basic draw one card to gain two more movement and we are going to head west one space and then north. Now, just before I go ahead and reveal the tile to the north with my last movement point, I do need to activate the Huntsman's Minion gets one move to pursue towards me because I moved off of a tile or space that an enemy exists in. And my plan here is to move north with my final move to reveal a new tile and to get into that new tile so that I'm further away from that particular enemy so far in fact that when the enemy's turn comes around to activate it won't move any further. All right, well, things are about to get a little bit more interesting. We did find the ransacked house, which is great. We are ending movement on it, so I will be revealing a card, card number 12 in a moment, but there's a number of things I need to populate on this game board at this point in time. The ransacked house looks pretty aggressive right now. We have a Huntsman's Minion in there and a Scourge Beast, plus we have two chests that we can potentially try and pull cards out of that could be bonuses that we can use going forward, but they're in a separate space. My movement has officially ended right now and I have a single card left. Before we decide what to do with that last card, we do get to reveal the card number 12 for being at the end of a move in the Ransacked House. It states here, Rescue. As you enter the Ransacked House, you catch sight of a young girl hiding in the corner from the monsters stalking her. Once these creatures are dispatched, she can be rescued. Place one survivor token on the Ransacked House space. So that's not going to be the space that I'm in, but the space where those two enemies are in. So that's going to be even harder to get to. And then we can just Decide to interact with it at some point and of course if we try to interact with it while there's enemies in there they're all going to get kind of an attack of opportunity against us and be able to thrash us uh, but what will likely be a better option is to potentially take them out but that could be quite tough 
So now, as you can see, there is a new survivor token that we can potentially go after for an insight mission in the back of the ransacked house, but I've got other plans. Looking at the current state of things, as well as how close we are getting to the reset option here, I don't really feel like trying to tackle or go up against these guys, taking them all out and then having the board get reset on me. So what I'm going to do instead is the fact that I have one blood echo on my board, I might as well actually head back to the Hunter's Dream. Although this may not be the most efficient use of the Hunter's Dream, it still is worthwhile to me because I can get myself back on that central lamp tile and then start exploring out from there there rather than having to deal with all of the enemies right now. I might find a better way to get insight that's not so tough. Using my final card, which is a dodge, I'll discard this card in order to go to the Hunter's Dream. Going to the Hunter's Dream removes my miniature from the game board. It also is going to take the survivor token I had walked away with from the occupied house and reset it back to the occupied house. And I place my miniature now in the Hunter's Dream. And for the first time, I'll walk you through how that works. But I want to talk something about strategy as to why I did what I did. As you remember, I was in the very front section of that ransacked house all by myself in my own space. But right beside me is a Scourge Beast and a Huntsman's Minion. So if I had chosen instead, to discard the card I had, the last one I had to gain two movement points. At the end of my movement, if I had moved out of any tile or space with enemies, those enemies would then pursue me. So basically, if let's say hypothetically I move south one space down to the occupied house tile, that first area, the bigger one, and then from there, I actually move west into the first space of the central lamp tile. If I was sitting there, then the pursuing would start happening. And that would start with the Scourge Beast who would move south one space and then south one space again because I moved out of that tile originally so it would be very close to me whereas the huntsman minion would only be moving one so yes I could have technically gone that route but remember then my turn would have ended then it would move over to the enemy's activation and because the scourge beast would have been in round or on the occupied house tile it would have moved into my space at that point on the central lamp tile and attacked me which is something I wasn't ready for for, nor did I want to happen and I kind of want to keep that blood echo even though there's only one it still gives me a benefit if I can get it back to the hunter's dream and timing wise if I can sync this up with the reset on the hunt track it's a good efficiency. And this will better click in your mind when you see how the Hunter's Dream actually works. So the very first thing you're going to do, and again, everything's laid out on the player aid. You can follow it once you've read the rulebook. But the first thing is you're going to advance the hunt track one space, which is going to put us one space away from a reset. So in terms of cons around the Hunter's Dream, the biggest one is that you're advancing the hunt track a little bit faster because when we eventually finish the Hunter's Dream and I head back to the game board, I begin another turn and and as you'll see, I'll move one more space up the track here. That's going to put us on a reset, which will have all the monsters restart and populate in the spawn areas that they're sitting in, which would have been disastrous, I think, if I had still been on the game board. So the reason I did this was strategically getting off the game board to go to the Hunter's Dream, even though I have one Blood Echo, to try and convert, get some cards, or a card, I should say, and then go back in. The other downside of the Hunter's Dream is that the only places you can return back to in the game are the lanterns. So unless you've revealed a whole bunch of them or they're at positions you like, it could be a pro, but it also could be a con. The next thing that you must do when at the Hunter's Dream is any Blood Echoes that you have, you cash them in and you take an upgrade card for each of them. So if I had I had the max of three, I could have taken three upgrades from this row. And the way it works is once you take the first upgrade, you populate a new one into the row. You can then take your second choice, populate, take your third choice, populate. But in this case, for me, I only have one Blood Echo. So I'm really just choosing from what's right here in front of me. And I've got some good options. To me, Bloodthirsty is a pretty amazing card. It's going to give me an extra damage, and then on a kill, it's going to allow me to draw and heal, which really stacks well with what I already have. Or if I flip my trick weapon over, I still have that ability going. The upgrade row is immediately populated again, and you can see we got a stagger with a plus one damage, which isn't too bad for a future grab. Another great benefit of the Hunter's Dream is you're going to take all your Hunter's Gear stat cards, which means those remaining in your Hunter deck, those in your discard pile, your hand, and then any of them that are sitting on your trick weapon, and you're going to reform your 12 card deck again. Now, the thing to make note of is if you've gathered upgrades from the Hunter's Dream, you are able 
able to slot them in on a one for one as you see fit. So in other words, I can go through my deck right now, the whole 12 cards, and pick any of those cards to get rid of, just one of them, to bring this new Bloodthirsty card in. It doesn't have to match the exact same type either. What's important to note is, as you saw, Blood Echoes have to be spent in order to upgrade cards, but slotting those upgrade cards into your deck is completely optional. It's worth mentioning that whether you're discarding a card from your 12 card deck to make room for an upgrade, or you're just going to discard the upgrade because you don't even like it compared to what you already have in your deck, whatever you discard in that situation is gone for the duration of the chapter. For me, I decided to go ahead and discard a basic draw one card. I'm gonna focus more on putting damage on them and keeping my staggers and dodges. Although drawing one, to be honest, that strategy is really awesome as well, giving you additional actions on your turn. Next, you can heal your hero all the way back up to its max, so this hunter goes back to 6 health. Of course, there shouldn't be any blood echoes left available in that section. If your hunter pistol was flipped over because you used the hunter pistol during gameplay when you were out in Yarmin, then at this point in the hunter's dream, you flip it back up, it's reloaded and ready to go. Now, on the back side of every weapon, there is a way in which you can actually reactivate or essentially reload the weapon, and that is specific to the weapon and you'll see it when you flip the one over. If we use the Hunter's Pistol as we move through the playthrough, you'll see exactly what that is. But anytime you go back to the Hunter's Dream, you get a free reload, which is quite nice. You shouldn't have anything going on on your trick weapon at this point in time. It should completely be clear. You do now get a choice as to which side of the trick weapon you'd like to go back into the map with. Now, I'm not 100% sure I'll use this side, but you'll notice that it does allow for a lot more fast and medium attacks at lower damage values, unless you're doing attacks with the stagger keyword. If you are, then those attacks actually become quite decent and are very quick. I'll go ahead and leave it on the opposite side as I want to try something a little different this time around and maybe use staggers to my advantage to pump up my actual attack values. We'll see how that goes. Now, the other thing I want to mention, the final things here inside the Hunter's Dream, is if you happen to have any reward cards that you have used, which we haven't gained any yet, but if you've used them and they're exhausted, they come back, you're able to use them again, and you also get to discard any poison or frenzy tokens that you have on you. But beyond that, that should reset your character. So at this point, my hunter is going to come back out onto the game board. As my hunter turn begins, I return back to the central lamp. I'm going to draw up three cards. And at this point in time, when you return back to the lamp is technically the exact moment that you decide which side of your trick weapon you want it to be on. So that's really important, especially when you're playing with multiple hunters. So that's worth mentioning. As we're beginning our Hunter's turn, we've got our cards. We also don't want to forget to uptick the track by one, putting us on one of the reset spaces. So what happens during a reset? Well, the first thing is all non-boss enemies, which are every enemy currently on the map, are going to be removed from the map. Then you're going to replenish all consumable tokens on the map. Then you're going to respawn all enemies related to the mission, or missions if any, then replenish all spawn points on the map, beginning with those closest to the hunters. And then the boss enemies are not removed from the map, but they heal all their damage. If they had entered phase two, they do not revert to phase one. So for me, this reset is not going to change too, too much, but there's a couple things that will. So essentially, I've gone ahead and respawned all the enemies on the game board based on the icons. The consumables didn't need to be reset because I haven't even gathered the ones from the ransacked house and everything's situated back where it should be. The only thing that's kind of a con of this whole situation is now we have a scourge beast, which is one tile away from me on the occupied house, which will trigger if I hang out or end my turn on the central lamp, it will activate and start coming towards me. So that's going to be a little cause for concern. Concern. All right, this time around, I'm working with a basic stagger, a basic dodge, and a basic plus one damage. Now, I think I don't really want to head back to the occupied house just yet, but I think that's going to be one of the ones I want to go after in the near future. For now, let's see if we can try at least find the chapel first to figure out how much effort it's going to be to bring that person there. Now, we're only a quarter way through right now on the time track, so I feel pretty good. We've got two insight missions we could potentially go after to get the insight we need to get back to the central 
lamp tile to progress the hunt mission, but we don't want to delay too, too long. For now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to choose to spend the basic plus one damage because remember, my trick weapon is on the side that when I use stagger, I get a plus one damage anyway. So this is a good one to discard for some movement. And it appears we have found a chapel, but it's not the one we're looking for. This tile is called the Church of the Good Chalice. And there's a couple things I want to mention about this tile that are pretty awesome. First off, we found a lamp. So I'll be placing a lamp miniature there. We also found two consumable slots. And you'll notice there's no spawns of any monsters. So this is a great one to get because we have access now to some consumables we haven't had yet. The other thing worth mentioning in the bottom right, which is upside down currently based on your view, states when interacting with one of the chests, because there's two icons in that space there for the church, uh, you can use one of them to gain a blood echo instead. So what's really cool is you can choose with a discarding of one card, you can interact in a space with as many interactable objects as you want. So for instance, if there's two chests in there, one discarding of a card to interact, you can take both chests. Now, when you take those two chests, you can take them both as consumables or based on this ability in the bottom right of the tile, take a blood echo and a consumable. Using my final action point, moving one space further in, you'll see the lamp tokens there now, as well as the consumable tokens. I've got two more cards to use here, and I really think, well, it's unfortunate I'm gonna have to burn a card just to move into the space with the chest, and then burn another card to interact with both of them, which will wipe out my entire turn, but I'm very safe where I currently am in this church. So burning my remaining two actions, one to get two movement points of which I'm only gonna use one because as soon as you use another action like interacting, which I'm gonna do with these two chests, I lose the movement point that I had not used because I moved to a next action. So these two cards get discarded. I now discard both of the chests and I get to choose. Do I wanna take a blood echo and a consumable or two consumables? And honestly, two consumables, I think for where I'm at right now, sounds like the best option. The two consumables I landed by interacting in the church was the pebble and the blood vial. Now the blood vial is pretty straightforward. You're going to be able to heal too. That's going to come in extremely handy, I'm sure. And then the pebble on the hunter's turn, and both of these actually had to be used on the hunter's turn. Uh, the pebble is a move one enemy within two spaces up to two spaces. It's important to note that consumables are one time use only. So once you use them, they're gone. All right. I think overall, I'm pretty happy with how this turn panned out. I have nothing left cards wise. At this point in time, we would check to see if there's anyone within a tile distance a way that can activate there is not so we move right past that go back into drawing three cards to our hand to start our next turn and we do have to move the hunt track up by one which i'll do right now the cards I have to use is a basic dodge, a basic stagger, and a basic stagger. So what I'm going to do is do a bunch of movement here to go as far north as possible and reveal another tile, hoping to find one of the tiles that I need in order to either push forward an insight mission or find the chapel so I can kind of put a plan together to get back to the occupied house and get that individual. I think that's the easiest insight mission to go after right now, being as the one up north is pretty well guarded and I want to be prepared for that. But I also have a plan up my sleeve here because I do have that pebble. So maybe as I run north up to the central lamp, maybe I'll turn and throw the pebble towards two, up to two spaces away towards that Scourge Beast and have it move two spaces back into the alleyway because that might actually free me up to get into the occupied house in the future more easily. But remember, I got to do this before the next reset happens and that thing shows up again. Or of course, I could always try and fight it. So I've moved my hunter three spaces. The fourth space will be into the brand new tile. Let's go ahead and draw from the deck and see what we get. We ended up revealing the courtyard lamp tile, which does tie back to the mission card that states when we end our movement on it, which we just did, we get to reveal card five. We found another insight mission we can go for. It's called On the Hunt. Entering, you find a large mob of townsfolk all gathered around a blazing pyre constructed in the center of the courtyard. Upon it lies the body of numerous scourge beasts. Suddenly from behind, you hear shouting, more infected as the mob begins to surround you. It states to reveal card six and then says, surround the courtyard lamp tile with fog gates, which we'll be doing momentarily. Spawn one hunter mob on its lamp space and it respawns to this space whenever we hit the reset space on the hunt track. At the bottom it says complete this mission by slaying this hunter mob. So that's all we need to do is just take out this mob. 
So the first thing that's going to happen is all the exits of the courtyard are going to have fog gates placed on them. The gates have been placed. There's no point in putting one on the right hand side because it doesn't actually connect through fully to the other tiles. So the only two spaces to escape from was to the west and to the south. Those have now been placed, but let's talk about what fog gates actually involve. Fog gate tokens are special tokens used to isolate that tile from the rest of the map. So when you're instructed to place them down covering exits, if the tile has a lamp, you're going to cover it with a broken lamp token as well. Finally, you're going to remove all the enemies from that tile except any that were spawned by the mission card that caused the fog gate. So in this case, it was this hunter mob. So those should be the only ones in here. If somebody else had chased you into this room when this had triggered, those monsters would be removed from the equation. Now while a tile is surrounded with these fog gates, hunters may enter a tile surrounded with the fog gates, but they can never leave except by going to the hunter's dream. Lamps covered by broken lamp tokens cannot be used by hunters, and they may not return to that space from the hunter's dream. So essentially if I go to the hunter's dream, I can leave this area, but then when I come back, I only have the choice between the lanterns that are actually not broken, which would be the central lamp tile currently and the church of the good chapel. Alice. It's also worth mentioning enemies cannot enter or exit a tile surrounded with fog gates. If pursuing a hunter, they will stop in the space adjacent to their tile. So in other words, if they are pursuing you, they will butt up against the fog gate, but that's as far as they will go. And enemies ignore all hunters separated from them by fog gates when they activate. Enemies not listed under the mission card do not spawn on that tile while the fog gates are active. Finally, fog gates are only removed when the mission card that created them is completed or when specifically instructed to do so. So in this case, we have an insight mission that tells us we need to slay this particular mob. Once we do this, then most likely we'll be able to deal with all the fog around it. So at this point, my options are fairly limited, but I've walked into a fog gate, so I can't just walk out of it. I could discard the last card I have to go to the Hunter's Dream, but I don't want to do that. I'd rather just stand and fight. Let's just take this thing out. Now, the downside is I only have a dodge card, so I don't really have much of anything going into this. So I'm going to go ahead and actually start an attack by using the last card that I have, the dodge card, to initiate it by putting it in the slash option there, which is two damage at a two speed or medium speed. Let's go ahead and find out what the enemy he plans to do. This time we've triggered an ability on the hunter mob. Not too sure this is going to be a positive. The ability says mob frenzy. Flip another enemy action. Hunter's mob next attack gains plus one on the speed and an additional damage. That's really unfortunate. Let's go ahead and pull that enemy action card. So the end result of the attack ends up being a basic attack. So it's an axe swing, but now it's going at a fast speed with three damage. Now I already sadly used my dodge card to initiate the attack so I don't have anything there but I do have a hunter pistol that can stagger the enemy if using a basic attack which it ended up doing. So I'm going to go ahead and flip that hunter pistol in order to stagger the hunter mob. You gotta love that hunter pistol coming in handy to stagger the attack. So now I'm not going to have to deal with that damage coming through but my damage still gets to go through. Also, as you saw in the last shot, the Hunter Pistol was turned over. It said at the bottom on the Hunter's turn, discard one card to refresh. So that's how we can bring the uh, pistol back without having to go to the Hunter's Dream to refresh it. We can discard a card to do it. Just like that, two damage up against the Hunter Mob. We got half of the damage on it. We need two more to go, but that's going to be the end. I have no more cards left to play. So we are now going to be moving to activating the enemies, which in this case, he's perfectly in the space he needs to be. Doesn't need to move anywhere. No one else enemy wise is going to be moving towards me. It's also worth mentioning that activation of the enemies. Once you start having a number of them around you, you go to the hunt board and you start activating them left to right across the board. But in this case, there's only one within a space that can gain access to my hunter, so it's just going to be us right now because, again, we're inside of a fog gate. It's pretty closed in. The hunters are going to go to their deck to pull and see what they're doing to me. I have no card whatsoever. I have nothing defensively here. Even my gun has already been used, so this damage is coming straight through. It ends up being a basic attack, which is a axe swing, so two damage coming to me directly. So not the end of the world. I have six health. I lost two. But remember, I have that blood vial and on my hunter's turn, I can heal back two, which means this attack did nothing to me. Just like that, combat has been resolved. We can now start a new turn. I'll draw three cards from my deck as well as move the hunt track one more space. 
After moving the track, this is where we currently are. We're getting closer and closer to the next reset point. It's worth mentioning too that any effects that are on stat cards that get slotted into an attack slot on your trick weapon, they're going to activate. So this dodge, I used it to activate an attack, but I still get to clear the slot anyway. So as of right now, that card goes in the discard pile. So further clarification on that one, whether it's used to go into an attack slot to actually do an attack or in an attack slot to do a dodge when you want to dodge somebody, regardless, the effect on that card is still going to trigger. These are the cards I have to work with on this next turn. Works for me. I have a plus one damage, a draw one, and a dodge. So I really should be able, hopefully, fingers crossed, to come out of this without being beaten up too badly. Now, it's my turn right now, Hunter's turn. I'm going to choose right now to use my Blood Vile Consumable. Actually, you know what? Maybe I won't because... Well, actually, you know what? My Trick Weapon Heal is on the other side right now, so maybe I will. I will go ahead and use the Vile. I don't want to end up dying in this situation right now, so let's go ahead, use the Vile, bumper ourselves back up to six and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to initiate an attack. The blood vial has been discarded. My health's back up to six. I'm now going to go ahead and take the basic plus one damage card. I'm going to slot it into a quick cut slot because I really want to go for a fast attack and hopefully if I get lucky I go faster than the hunter's mob because based on what their current speed is they go medium. So I have a pretty good chance unless the ability card comes out again which it won't and this again helps with the strategy of things. We know that inside this deck there's three basic two special one ability. The ability cards already come out and it hasn't reshuffled yet so I know going into this by doing a quick cut with a plus one damage I'm guaranteed to slice this thing down before it even gets a chance to come back at me saving me the ability to need to use any kind of dodge and the card that came up is a basic attack so it's medium speed two damage and this is a perfect example of where you don't want to burn cards dodging. I do have two cards in hand right now. I have this one here and a dodge. I could place the dodge in one of these slots, like the quick cut one, and dodge the damage coming from the hunter mob. But why would I? If my resolution of the actual attacks, my attack is going to be faster than the enemy's. Wasting a dodge right now doesn't make any sense. So I'm holding on to both those cards and I'm going to just continue past the dodge step to the resolution of the combat. I get to go first in my resolution because my speed is faster. So I get my two hits through first and that's enough to take out the hunter mob without me even taking any damage. Now, if our speeds had been exactly the same, the resolution of combat states, they both happen simultaneously. And there is wording around this and how effects apply when you have timing at the exact same moment in the rule book, but for the most part, both parties take the damage and everybody gets hurt. Now, one correction I need to make, and it's a perfect time to notice this because I didn't actually reveal card six as it mentioned on the insight card for On the Hunt just above it. So I just revealed card number six. I should have done this the second we were placing the fog gates around and everything else, but again, I was describing how the fog gates work and didn't get back to actually revealing that card number six. And this is card six, and it's not fun. It says to place an insight token on this card. If there's three plus hunters, place an additional token. Now, when a hunter mob would be slain, which is literally right now, instead, remove one token and heal all the damage from it. All tokens are returned when you hit one of those reset spots. So these are pretty nasty. So basically, I did enough damage to literally just remove the token off of this card. So I have taken down four of its total eight strength. So I'm quite happy I caught that when I did because the four damage I just put on it would remove the token. So I'm not going to bother putting the insight token on there. But if I had have set it up correctly from the get-go, this horde card would have an insight token on it, which would then after four damage be removed, which happened right now. Now I still have to put four more damage on this thing to take it out. So we got more work to do, but I still have cards. So let's keep on attacking this thing. I'm going to place one of my cards, the basic draw one into the slash position, giving me a speed two or medium attack speed two damage but I immediately when I put that card in there get to draw one so I'll take one right now well that makes me happy because I already had the dodge card which is perfect for my upcoming attack plus I have a slot ready to put it in if I need it but I just picked up from that draw the really cool upgrade card I got from the hunter's dream which should certainly help me out the last card is pulled from the enemy action deck it's a special card so in this case for the hunter mob it's going to be a two or medium attack speed two damage it has stagger and stun. 
Well, I know what I'm doing, and that is using my Dodge card in that center slot for a Speed 3 Dodge. And then it's going to be cleared out and put in my discard pile. So because my Dodge was at a faster speed or the same as the attack coming at me, the special's a 2 medium, and I'm using a 3 speed slot, I'm able to dodge this attack in its entirety. That includes the attack as well as any of the effects as well. So I don't have to deal with stagger or stun. My attack does two damage to the mob and they're still standing. They need two more damage to go down. And guess what? Because I was able to get that draw one card, I still have a card left to play. And guess what? I'm absolutely going to use this rather than letting them sit around and hit me again. I'm going to use Bloodthirsty. And this one is a plus one on damage. Also states on kill, draw one, heal one. I won't have a dodge for this one though. So I've placed Bloodthirsty right in the middle. It's going to give me a two damage, three speed, on kill, draw one, heal one. So I can't take advantage of the draw one, heal one until I kill this thing, but that's going to be nice because I probably will need some healing and getting an extra card afterwards. I mean, that's a positive. Now, what gets a bit more concerning for me this time around in combat is, again, don't have a dodge, but also the deck, the enemy deck, is shuffled again, which means I don't know which of the three is going to come at me. Basic, special, or ability, we're about to find out. Oh no, it's throwing its special at me. That is going to be a shield bash, so a two-speed, two-damage attack coming at me with stagger and stun. Next step of combat is, can I dodge or not? No, I cannot, so we go to resolving the combat. We go based on the speed of the attacks my speeds at three very fast or i should say fast and the enemy the hunter mobs is a medium so i get to go first which means two damage goes through which is enough to kill it and then i get to draw a card and heal one and i don't even need a heal so thankfully even though the special landed on the hunter mob i went fast enough in the combat to avoid being hit by the stagger and stun so that hunter mob is going to get sent packing, which is also going to resolve the insight mission. We have to pull card seven. So these two cards will disappear. Card seven will come into play. The fog gates are going to clear and the broken lamp is going to go back to a regular lamp. When you see the front of a card that looks like this, you have gained some insight. You have completed a row of cards based on an insight mission and got to the end. So it states here, distribute the hand lantern reward and Ludwig's rifle firearm among the hunters. Well, I'm the only hunter so i get everything which is awesome it says driven to frenzy by the early stages of the infection the townsfolk are compelled to partake in the hunt believing that by eradicating the beast from the plague will be quelled as well from their remains you gather what useful supplies you can find here are the two things I just gained. The Ludwig's rifle says when an enemy moves into your space, so you of course could slot this in instead of your hunter pistol. Uh, when an enemy moves into your space, deal two damage to that enemy. That's pretty awesome. Of course, it will also get uh, used up, flipped over, and need to be re-brought back up through the hunter's dream or whatever is on the opposite side, which I might as well show you guys in case we want to actually put it on. This one needs two cards to refresh. It's a little bit better. And then down below, the hand lantern says on your hunter turn teleport to any space now this being a reward card is one of the cards that can be used exhausted and then when you go to the hunter's dream and you refresh everything this card comes back up and is available again for future use it is not a consumable so it's not a one-time use it's just a one-time use in the context of it still needs to be refreshed but needs to be a hunter's dream refresh and that's not all because of the bloodthirsty card I had on kill. I get to heal one, which I don't need because I'm full health, but I get to draw one. So now I have another card to use on this hunter turn if I choose to. A hunter can only carry one firearm at a time. If they would gain a different firearm, which I've just done, you can replace it with the previous one, but you got to place any unused ones to the side. Hunters keep any collected firearms throughout the entire campaign and you can switch them out between between chapters. I've chosen seeing as my hunter pistol was already used up and exhausted to go ahead and switch it out for Ludwig's rifle and then I've placed the hunter pistol off to the side. Of course it's worth noting in between chapters you can't obtain another hunter's starting weapon either. 
With the card I just used, I'm going to go ahead and discard it in order to transform my weapon. And just like that, we now have slots available on our trick weapon. That's going to end my hunter's turn, and we move to the end of the hunter turn where enemies can activate within one tile, if they happen to be within one tile, which none of them are because the tile just to the east of us is not connected by an open pathway, so they're not going to activate. No one's going to activate, and I've done this strategically to keep these things from coming after me and I've got a plan as to how I'm going to go about getting my next insight as well. To begin my next hunter turn I've drawn up three cards it's worth noting I only had one card left in my hunter deck so I drew that one card then I took my discard pile and I had to reshuffle it to create the deck again and then drew two cards from that it ended up with me having two basic draw one cards in hand and one basic stagger. I've moved the hunt token one more space forward. It rests right here, and we are very close to a reset in the near future. And that's going to wrap up part number one for the long hunt. Join me as we continue the playthrough to see how this pans out as I attempt to go after another insight mission to gain the insight I need to have two to head back to the central lamp tile and progress the hunt mission overall in chapter number one of the long hunt. Really hope you guys enjoyed this and hope you enjoyed the slower pace in this video to get everybody on board with an understanding of how the game plays. I was glad to be able to catch two of my goofs along the way and correct them at the perfect time frame without there having too many ripple effects throughout the gameplay. Thanks again for watching. Let me know in the comments if I missed anything and I'll see you in the next episode and as always keep on rolling solo.